This session in particular is on the shape of the Jesus movement. Um, I'm Stephanie Spellers, Canon for Evangelism and Reconciliation. I'm Jay Seidbotham, and I serve as Director of uh, Renewal Works, which is a ministry of forward, forward movement. Yes. And, um, and so we're going to be sharing, and we've had a lot of fun talking with each other about the shape of this Jesus movement. So we wanted to share some with, with everybody else so that we can all start to feel like we own this movement and have a role as leaders in this movement. Um, so it begins with understanding that the Jesus movement did not begin with presiding bishop Michael Curry. It did not begin when he started kind of coining some phrase. Even he will tell you that, um, that the Jesus movement is language that, um, that scholars and other folks have used all along. Um, and then in many ways, when people were identifying those early followers of Jesus, they called them followers of the way. And they understood that they were part of a movement. Um, so really, we're just following through on all of that. We're following through on what Jesus started when he gathered up that whole posse of folks um, to share life, to share the love of God with each other and with a wider and wider circle of people. Um, and then he sent them out and he said to them, go, go and heal, go and teach, go and pray, go and love, go knit a broken world back together again. Jesus was doing all of that, and in it, he started a movement. Um, he started a movement. Um, of course, the Book of Common Prayer then perfected it. So, <laughs> um, the Narcatechism, we describe the mission of God in this way, and maybe we can read this together. The mission, mission of the, of the church, church is to restore, restore all, all people to unity, unity with God, with God and, and each other, other in Christ. Christ. Um, so that is not just some nice statement in a book. That is actually a way of understanding who we are, what we do. It's the heart of a movement. So this is how we describe that movement um, on the presiding bishop staff and with the help of the um, presiding officers as well. We've been trying to figure out, so how do you name this movement? Really riffing on the catechism. And here's what we've come to that we are, and you can read this with me too, following Jesus, Jesus growing, growing, loving, liberating, life-giving life relationship with God. with God, that's evangelism, with each with other, other, that's reconciliation, <laughs> and, and with, with creation, creation, environmental stewardship. Um, so, so what we're going to look at today is the way that that movement begins to overflow. Um, the way that this movement really starts out with following Jesus, following Jesus in our worship, spiritual practice, prayer, formation, service, but then how that especially flows or overflows into evangelism, which is how we listen for God's movement in our lives and in the world, get deeply grateful, and then share it. And how it overflows into reconciliation, which is where we embody the loving, liberating, life-giving way of Jesus with each other. But it begins with following Jesus, and there's no better person in our church to be teaching about this than a man, Jay Seibach. Don't well, Jay? I don't, don't know Jay. about that, but thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm honored to be asked by Stephanie to share with you a little bit about what we're learning about discipleship. Uh, basically, I've uh, my kids have been telling me on this thing with Renewal Works, Dad, you got to better come up with a better elevator speech. And the elevator speech at which we have arrived is that we are building cultures of discipleship in Episcopal congregations, that we are taking them where they are and seeing where they feel called to go and how we can make that kind of movement. That mission statement of the church, restoring God's people to unity, is essentially a story of movement, of change, of transformation going from here to there, whatever the here is, whatever the there is. And so how we do that as disciples is key. So I'm just gonna talk, and Stephanie asked me to share, because we've been doing this work for about five years with Episcopal congregations, and we've worked with 150 congregations. We're learning some things about the distinctive um, Episcopal culture, which uh, I'll say at the baseline, uh, probably in many ways saved me, but also has some unique characteristics uh, which enter into this discussion of how we think about um, discipleship. So 
I don't know if you can all read these. If not, it's on the little sheet we got out. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful um, little form that, that Stephanie's put together. But we're going to just talk about the discipleship, growing hearts for Jesus through prayer, worship, formation, spiritual practice, fellowship, and action. So, you know, the question could be asked, what is the place of discipleship in the Jesus movement, and why uh, on earth are we talking about it as an evangelism conference? But it really is about growing hearts for Jesus. We've heard this again and again over the past, I agree with you, it feels like we've been here for a, a good amount of time, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but there have been a lot of conversations that it's about growing hearts, mm -hmm. um, about that change that comes uh, with people's uh, affections and how that affects the way they act. One of, one of the pieces we've learned in Renewal Works is that spiritually vital congregations, in whatever way they do it, embed scripture in as many things they can think of as possible in, the, in their common life. And so I, I thought it was probably a, a good cue. And we've, I, again, I've heard this several times in the past 24 hours, that at the heart of our, our, the Jesus movement is, uh, is not program. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about love. And so we turn to, you know, this lawyer comes up to Jesus, as we heard last night, and says, you know, what's, what's the deal? What are, we, um, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> what are we supposed to do? to inherit eternal life, and Jesus says, well, it's simple, it's not easy. Mm. It's one thing, but it's really two. Mm. Um, it's about where your heart is. And so one of the things that I think we need to think about in discipleship in this work of building cultures of discipleship, um, I, I was, I was kind of riffing on what the presiding bishop was, was saying. It's, um, it's not about bigger churches, it's about a better world. Mm. It's not about a bigger list of programs. It's about hearts that are made open to following Jesus. So how does that happen? What does that look like? That's the challenge of discipleship. So I'm, I'm just going to share a little research that we've gotten from Episcopal churches and a, and, a, and a total group of churches. And in the work that we do, there's a survey or an inventory that people take which describes their own spiritual experience. It gives them opportunity to talk about where they are in the spiritual journey. So there are categories and... Um, there's more information on the table if you want to look more deeply in all this. But anyway, uh, people self-select into categories that are not perfectly defined, but they're sort of exploring Christ, just beginning in the spiritual journey, growing in Christ, um, sort of thinking they're in, but still not sure of their place in all of this, close to Christ and then Christ-centered. And you can see, probably can't see, but the numbers are, most of the people are in the first half and the, and the great preponderance of people in all of the sample of the churches that we've done are in that second stage, growing Christ, but having some opportunity to go deeper. The Episcopalians um, are just more so to that effect, that they are kind of early on in this continuum, in this, this is movement. This is a movement of going deeper in a life with Christ, being more centered in Christ. And the thing I take away, and I can talk about this for hours, but I won't. <laughs> the thing I take away from this and I found it in my experience as a rector and as an associate, is a lot of the work of evangelism probably needs to take place first in our own congregations. Go ahead. That we um, need to find ways to invite people who are already in our pews to experience some of the thing, maybe something like we did this morning, to just say, um, how can I go deeper? That is, that, um, one of the lines we, we, we often say to folks is, you, you can't give what you don't have. Mm -hmm. You can't give what you don't have. And so how is it that we invite people uh, to go deeper? That's the movement that we're uh, working on in this. Um, and we find, actually, as we talk to people, that in the Episcopal culture, there are actually things that people self-identify as being helpful in making spiritual movement or going deeper or becoming a fo closer follower of a Christ, whatever language you want to use. We did this research, and, a lot, and most of the database from churches is, not, is, is maybe non-liturgical churches and certainly not, Episcop, uh, not Episcopal churches. And when we did this research and found it from the churches, uh, the researchers called us up. They weren't Episcopal. They said, what's this Eucharist thing? <laughs> what's this Eucharist thing? It appears to be transform transformational in the life of your people. And it was so interesting to find that. And it, and it, it says, how do we help people become better disciples uh, in the quality of our worship, in the thoughtfulness that goes into it, in the prayer before it, in the teaching about it, how is the Eucharist part of that? 
different ways of praying. We find in the continuum, people pray for different things. Sort of uh, in the early stages, people pray, and I pray this way a lot. What I call the God as valet prayer. You know, like, I would like this to happen, and I please, could this happen, and it would be nice if this happened, and not this. The longer, the, the further along in the continuum, this is another sort of interesting feature of the Episcopal community. I'll see if it resonates with you. The long, yes. Am I going too fast? That help, would that be helpful? I get going. I can't help myself. Okay. <laughs> getting just, excited. Just interrupt me again if that, if that would help. Sure, sure. Interesting piece is that uh, the deeper people go in their own spiritual lives, the more they gravitate towards contemplation and solitude and uh, kind of a contemplative life, which I think, I don't know if you witness this, I see this happening all over. Yeah. That the more people want to go deeper in this life of discipleship, the more they want to shut up mm. and just listen. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something there for us in that. Um, so things that seem to be making a difference in the lives of our community, engagement with scripture, whatever that looks like in the particular Episcopal way that you choose to do that, uh, recognizing and celebrating and exploring the transforming power of the Eucharist, uh, uh, ever deeper prayer life, and particularly uh, the heart of the leader and the call for the leader to work on his or her own discipleship, um, to remember why they got into this in the first place. Remember that sense of call. Um, again, in the spirit that as we try to build cultures of discipleship, we can't give what we don't have. And so uh, to help leaders explore that. Uh, one other piece I just wanted to share um, is that in all of this work with churches, uh, researchers have identified certain archetypes of Episcopal churches and they basically net out of the 150 we've done in three categories. Um, one is uh, most people, I don't know if you can see it, 55% are in the category they call troubled. I want them to change that category. It really is restless. Mm -hmm. It's really like we want more in the spiritual journey. We have that Augustinian restlessness, that God-shaped space, that hunger, and we're not sure we're getting it in our churches. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, we're not sure our leaders know how to provide it. Mm. Um, the yellow one is extroverted. This is distinctive character of Episcopal churches that there's a strong call to mission and outreach and a distinctive lack of clarity about why that's a Christian thing to do. Uh -huh. uh, not making the Matthew 25 connection. The third one, which is the tough nut, which is like, uh, they call it complacent, which is like, you know, uh, we had one person come and tell her rector, you know, I don't know why you're talking about movement and transformation. I don't really expect anything to happen to me from coming to church. So that's hard. That is difficult to deal with. And I, I don't know, I, I feel like I've run across that dynamic in the culture of the Episcopal Church, that I come and that's fine and don't ask me to do too much. And God forbid, don't ask me to share my testimony with the person next to me. So, <laughs> um, that piece of complacency is something I think we need uh, to find ways to crack. Um, so there is an urgent need to recognize that we can't keep doing what we've been doing. I had to throw in a church pension group cartoon just because um, <laughs> it, it calls us to uh, <laughs> think of how we look at this in, in new ways and to, um, I think the challenge really for whatever leadership piece has brought you here to think about our own discipleship um, and that phrase, you can't give what you don't have, you can't share an experience you haven't had mm -hmm. and to really work on that. So that's, that's kind of the discipleship piece um, this is hard, hard to see on this particular um, screen, but basically the bubbles or the equation is strong disciples and healthy parishes are the basis or lead to effective evangelism. So um, that's sort of the setup for getting moving into evangelism and reconciliation. 
I'm going to shift this up a little bit. Can I do this? I wanted to do an exercise. We don't do it in pairs. But one of the questions, it's related to what we did before, but maybe a little different. One of the things that we invite people to do in these conversations is to reflect on their own spiritual lives and to particularly reflect on the catalysts in their own spiritual life that made a difference. So I want to ask you just to think of a time in your own life when you experienced what you would call spiritual growth, whatever that is. We'll take a minute in silence. And I'm going to ask you to say, what was it about that period of your life that triggered or catalyzed or induced or caused or promoted or evoked or provoked um, spiritual growth. So a, a phase, a passage, could be a day, it could be a year, um, marked by spiritual growth in your own life and what that was about. Any do you want to brave that? Sorry? Get comfort? Discomfort. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here we go. Donahue. Yeah. <laughs> that caused the spiritual growth, the discomfort. Yes? Great loss. Great loss. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting piece because we ask a flip question, what were periods when you experienced uh, spiritual inertia or I, I always use car metaphors, I got a flat tire or in the ditch or ran out of gas or whatever it is. Um, same answer. So that period of discomfort, loss can be transformative or it can be the thing that gets in the way. It's just interesting and I think as leaders that's sort of how we help people through that, coach people through that process is important. Yes? Retirement. So my husband and I both retired, and we had more time. So you recommend it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that we're being involved in, and we've only started going back to church uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And we'd wake up in the morning, okay, time to go to church. And have yeah. Fun. So that retirement part. And let me do again the flip side of what people say consistently gets in the way is that they're busy, mm -hmm. that their schedules are too full to figure out how to focus on discipleship. So, anything else? Yes. Say it again. Um, the realization it came down like a ton of bricks that um, what was wrong with my life was that I had not put God first and foremost in my life, above family, work, all my interests. And so I'd crowded God out. So you can decline to answer, but I'm wondering what triggered that realization? I was at a, um, at church. And it was the, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that realization was, oh, that is what is wrong with my life. I have, of course, I was, I thought I was the pillar of the church. Um, but what I had not done was a total surrender. Yeah. And my life is, that was 18 years ago. My life has never turned back. Beautiful. I put two quotes on the, on the sheet for, uh, that have guided me in this ministry. One from Brian McLaren, who asks a question which really zoomed in on me in my church where I was working. Are we a club for the elite who pretend to have arrived, or are we a school for the disciples who are still on the way? Mm. And, uh, and, and in his latest book, he's, he's added to that idea of the metaphor of church as school, um, the, the metaphor of church as studio. And uh, my wife's a yoga teacher, and it's like, it's so interesting to go. I'm always in the back row, and I never go when parishioners are, you know, doing yoga. But, uh, <laughs> um, but it's interesting to talk about your thing about practice. You know, people are practicing that with intention in those studios, and I think that's in many ways what we're called to be doing in our churches. One more, and then I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. I've, oh. got, I've got the mic, and I would just like okay. My, the most significant spiritual growth I ever experienced was following my Perseo weekend. Uh, the experience of that and the love and the 
for me, it was an eye-opening experience uh -huh. of really understanding what a relationship with Jesus Christ is. And there was absolutely no way that I could be quiet. I could no longer be that person on the pew that was, you know, in that category of complacency, probably. Yes. Um, and just, you know, you have to get out. Yeah. You know, I could have put speakers on my car, walked around with sandwich boards. But if you could just <laughs> tell the world, Jesus loves you. Yeah. You know, so for me, that was a, a, a very groundbreaking experience for my life. Beautiful. Anything else? One more, I thought. Yes. Oh, I think we have someone over here. Yeah. This is going to sound crazy, but confirmation year uh, was... <laughs> confirmation year. I know. It happens. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. Uh, at, at, what, at, at, at what age? Uh, what, 13. 13? Yeah, that's good, to, that's good to hear. There'll be so many people who'll be glad to hear that. You go. It's not in vain. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All that prep. Um, so, so I, I get excited when I hear the research that Renewal Works has done and the way that they are creating tools and pathways for Episcopalians in particular to, to go through this um, kind of this journey, you know, growing disciples, growing churches, and then again, seeing the way that as we grow as Christians, as we grow as followers of Jesus, we... Um, we begin to engage in evangelism and reconciliation differently. It's sort of like what my sister back here was saying after your Curcio weekend. You're like, I couldn't not talk about this. <laughs> like, I had to share. Um, you know, that, that ideally there's a catalyst. Right. And that catalyst, um, I mean, I guess there's several of them. There's a catalyst that drives you deeper into faith, and then that catalyzes the movement into sharing faith. That catalyzes the movement into reconciled relationship. Um, so, so what we know then is that God has invited us um, you know, to, to grow these hearts for Jesus through our practices, through our prayers, and that once we have been filled with that kind of love, um, God has invited us to pour it out. And we pour it out um, we pour it out, especially in the form of evangelism. Now, of course, this is the topic that, that is our topic for this entire conference. Um, and it's interesting because for so many Episcopalians, it's just not a word we say. How many of you told somebody that you were coming to this conference and they're like, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, lots of us have that experience, you know, where we're grabbing onto this word it feels like we're, you know, it's, we have to be tentative somehow. Um, and I even remember working with, um, with another priest who, um, who, like we were working on some things and I was going to use the word evangelism and he shuddered. <laughs> he actually shuddered. He was like, <laughs> I hate that word. Uh. Um, and I grew up down south, so I also understand a little bit of the shuddering that I, I particularly saw in my context. A lot of folks who gave you a reason to shudder when you thought about evangelism. Um, you know, I remember the kids in my high school coming to school on Monday morning after on Sunday they had prayed for me when they were making their lists of, you know, who do you know who's not Christian? And then they would all make a beeline for me because I was the only non-Christian in the school, it seemed like. And they would all kind of come and like hover around me and say, Stephanie, we're worried about you. We're worried because if we all died tomorrow, you wouldn't be in heaven with us. And I remember telling them, if that's the way your God works, I'm kind of okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I get you know, that we don't want to embrace an evangelism that's about just getting out of, getting your ticket out of hell, and we don't want to embrace an evangelism that starts out with telling people what they don't know. Who wants to hear that? That's not good news, for the record, going around telling people, here's what's missing, here's what's wrong with you, but I can fix it. That may feel like good news to you, it often doesn't feel like good news to the person on the other end of it. Um, so instead, what we believe, what we are discovering, 
is that evangelism begins with listening. It doesn't begin with what you say, it begins with what you listen to and what you notice. Um, it begins with listening for the good news, the good news of Jesus loving, liberating, life-giving activity. So really almost like being a scout is what you're doing. You're looking around to say like, what is God up to? What is Jesus up to? Where do I see the signs of this loving, liberating, life-giving way of Jesus? In my life, kind of like the cards that we were turning, um, but also in other people's lives. And then what's the gratitude I feel welling up in me as I see this evidence of Jesus' activity? And then how do I name it? How do I name it? Um, that's not coercion. To do those things, it's not coercion. It's actually trusting that the Holy Spirit will work something out if I participate with the Spirit by noticing, being grateful, and naming what's good, what's good news. So we're getting attuned to God's activity in our lives, and here's Here's a definition a little bit bigger for you. Um, and really helping people to discover their place in the Jesus movement. Um, so, like, if this is something that's made your life amazing, yeah, you want to proclaim, but, um, but you also do want to issue some of that invitation to say, hey, if you want to walk with me, I'd love to walk with you. Um, so that's this comprehensive way of understanding evangelism. Um, for a lot of Episcopalians, we lean in this direction. <laughs> we lean toward what St. Francis said about, um, about evangelism. A lot of us want to go out and to proclaim the good news. You know, we have that phrase, of course, in the baptismal covenant, proclaim the good news in word and deed. We really want to keep it to the deed. <laughs> we really want to just kind of go around doing something, but don't make me say anything. And then we point to St. Francis. And we say, see, he said it's okay. <laughs> he said it's all right if, if I don't say anything. I would like to suggest to you that today, use words, it is necessary. It's necessary because so many of our communities don't have a language or an image of Christianity. Um, you heard what Presiding Bishop Michael was sharing yesterday. You know, when millennials think about Christian, there's a whole list of things they think of and it's, it's probably not what you're imagining when you think of Christian. So if you're out there doing all your good deeds, doing all of your outreach, but you're not saying anything about Jesus, why do you think anybody is going to associate Jesus with what you do? Jesus is not in the vocabulary that way. So part of what we have to do is, yes, proclaim the gospel at all times, but then we have to narrate. We have to say, and by the way, the reason I'm here is Jesus. The reason I'm here is because I see God in you. We can't assume that people will look and say, oh, there's a radiant human being. Must be Jesus in her. It's not true anymore. It's not true anymore. Um, so so um, what I know is that I've experienced doing evangelism kind of like this, and... Um, and it's been incredibly freeing, and I even just want to kind of share with you a tiny bit about what it's been like to do this, to use the words because it is necessary, especially in spaces where they're not thinking about Jesus when they're looking at someone like us. Uh, I used to go after, um, after my church service. I led a church in Boston that met Thursday nights, and, um, and so after worship, we would go to a restaurant and kind of hang out, and then at about 10 o'clock, we're like, clubs open, yes. Um, I know, like what you do after church, right? <laughs> um, so, so we got all excited, and so, you know, like once a month, we would do this. After church, we would go to the club, and we would go, and we would dance, and there I was, the priest in the collar, um, which didn't stand out in any way <laughs> at all. Um, some people had studs on their collars. I did not. But <laughs> um, so we're there and we're dancing and we're just kind of interacting and inviting people onto the dance floor. And inevitably, people would be watching. <laughs> and you could see them kind of huddled in circles like, what 
is going on over there? And then they would send an, 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 a miss, or a, an emissary, thank you, over to our group and be like, excuse me, um, what are you? <laughs> and we're like, well, we're, you know, we have church Thursday nights, and you know, after church, we come here. And they're like, why? <laughs> And we got to say, because we see God here. We see God in the community that you formed. We see God in the way that you are healing one another in this liberation space. We see God in, um, in your celebration of life in the midst, for many of them, of oppression. Um, we see God all over. And, and we like being here with you because we see God in you. And it was amazing how many folks were like, can we talk? Because <laughs> if that's the God you know, then maybe there's more that I want to talk about, about maybe where I've seen this God. And I didn't know that that was God moving. It's an incredible experience to walk alongside and to help folks to discover what God in Christ has been up to with them all along. This is an evangelism that we can practice. This is an evangelism that is deeply respectful, that is curious, that is not know-it-all, that welcomes people to a journey where they have some agency as well. And again, for a lot of folk, they've been on a spiritual path. God has been talking to them. Maybe now they're in a place where when we come alongside, it's ready to be cracked open. It's ready to drop deeper. Um, this reminds me of the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, people may remember this story um, from the book of Acts, where um, the eunuch is coming back from the temple. And, um, and this is a eunuch who's been serving in the, um, in the court of the Candace. Um, so he's pretty high up in things. But, um, but as a eunuch, he was on the margin. As a eunuch, um, he would have been seen as damaged, damaged goods. And in fact, even for him to have been at the temple at all was stunning because technically he couldn't come into the courts of the temple, into the inner courts. He had to be like on some outer area. But he went anyway. So clearly this dude was hungry. This dude was curious. And so he's in his chariot and he's on his way um, back home again and, um, and then there's Philip, who's kind of cruising down the road himself. And the Holy Spirit lands on Philip and says, go, go to that chariot. And Philip's like, you've got to be kidding. I'm on foot, that's a chariot. <laughs> but he goes and he runs, says he runs to catch up with this chariot. And he comes alongside and sure enough, there's a eunuch reading reading scripture, but not actually knowing what is this thing I'm looking at. And um, Philip says, well, you know, would you like to talk about what you're seeing? And the eunuch's like, yeah, actually I would. And so he comes up and he starts to explain to him that what he's seeing, the story that he's seeing is actually the story of Jesus. And it's a story of another one who has suffered, another one who found a way out of no way, another one who had to discover his belovedness when the world said it wasn't there. And this eunuch is like, I want that. Because that's my story. I know that story. Why don't you baptize me right now? And he even says, you know, he says, is there anything to prevent it? And the answer, of course, was yes. <laughs> There's lots to prevent it. You're a eunuch. We're nowhere near any community or any whatever. Like, we can't just baptize you right here. But instead, Philip says, yeah, we're doing this right now. Because actually, Philip had been converted, too, for the record, in this encounter with the eunuch. And the eunuch is baptized, goes racing to keep telling the story, goes racing, can't be quiet about it. But it's all because Philip came alongside with his curiosity and notice what God was already doing in the life of that eunuch. And both of them were changed for good. So I want to invite you now to think of your neighborhood. Think of the areas that you call home. 
and take a moment, and this is an imaginative exercise, so take a moment right now and imagine that you're kind of like Philip, that you're the one who's walking the neighborhood and you see a place, you see a person, you see a community, you see an activity, and you see God. You see Jesus alive in whatever that group of people is doing, whatever that person is up to. Ponder for a moment what that is. Actually, like, allow yourself, like, picture, do a scan of your neighborhood. Imagine you're doing a walk around your neighborhood where you live or near your church, and imagine that you're kind of looking around. Where do you see God alive out there? Not inside the church, but out there. Take a minute. I'm actually like, I'll be quiet and give you one minute to really like to picture. Where do you see God alive? Where is that unit right in that carry? Is there a community center? Maybe it's a soccer field where the parents really do take care of each other and each other's kids. Maybe it's that clinic where folks go for free care and you see them coming out looking digni dignified. Where do you see God out there? I want to invite you now to find a partner. This is what we do. We just keep practicing it. We just keep practicing it. So find a partner. Find that one other person. Go ahead. One other person. If you need, I'm going to tell you what to do, but first get your partner. If you need one, look around. Anybody need a partner? Hold up your hand if you need a partner. Is there somebody who's free who needs a partner? Anybody who's in a three, maybe, and it's time to break it into two? Could you come over here? Okay, great. <clears throat> all right, so everybody has a partner who wants one. You're also more than welcome to kind of sit and take it in, but if you want a partner, make sure you've got one. And now here's what we're going to do. Again, this is an imaginative exercise. So imagine that the person across from you is actually a part of the activity or the community or whatever the thing is where you've seen God in your neighborhood, where you've seen Jesus alive near you. So imagine that this person is in that group or is maybe doing that work. Are you with me? And so now you're going to say to them, where do you see Jesus in this? What do you see of Jesus in what you see in what they do or in who they are? So you can use second person. So you're actually addressing them as you. Now, you may not know a thing about the person across from you. In fact, it is definite that this is not the person about whom you're speaking. <laughs> um, but that's why it's imaginative. Um, so, so you're trying this on, trying on sitting with someone and saying thank you. Thank you for being Christ 
near me. That's all we're doing. Does this make sense? Great, great. So, so the first person, the first partner, you'll be addressing your partner, kind of the person across from you, as if they are in that group. You'll have two minutes to do this. And then when I let you know that it's time to switch, you'll pause, take that deep breath, and then the other person will be able to share um, kind of addressing that, of, addressing that imaginative community or person to whom they are grateful. Are you with me? All right, great. Then go for it. Partner number one, take two minutes. Thirty seconds left. So the first person sharing, thirty seconds left. Partner one, thank you for sharing that gratitude. Thank you for sharing your gratitude. I have gratitude for your gratitude. <laughs> and now, partner number two, if you will share, again, imagining that the person across from you is a representative of that group to whom or that activity for, for which you are so grateful. Go for it. Two minutes. Thirty seconds left for the person sharing right now. Thirty seconds.
can wrap that up. You can wrap that up. <laughs> So how did it feel doing that? What's that? Say that. Very cool. Very cool, <laughs> hey. <laughs> that was worth amplifying, heck yeah. Can you imagine doing something like that with, with the actual people to whom you're grateful? What's that? Oh, he's going tomorrow. All right, great. <laughs> you were saying, go ahead. I kind of find it um, uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, and, and it's not the person that I'm sharing with. It's my. It's within me. Yeah. Because I've always told myself. I've always told myself. I've always told myself it's what I have got to say or what I think or feel. It's like it's not all that important. Mm. I've always said, you know, I'm not oh. all that important. Actually, it is. Just have to sit closer. Just don't Here. What you have to say. What is I important. have to say isn't important. Yes. I'm not that important in mm. in like when people get mad at you and go, well, you. I said, no. What did I do to make you mad at me? It's I'm not that important that you should get upset with. Mm. And then again, it's the other way around. If it's all the good things, you know, why should I share that? I'm not mm. all that important. Is anybody else? struggle or feel some of that, that like, why would I share what I'm observing or what I'm noticing or tell anybody that I see God in them? Why do they need to, why would I talk? Who wants to hear from me? Anybody have that? Yeah, yeah. Has anyone worked with that experience and maybe have something to say about how you, um, how you come out on the other side of that and maybe discover that, that you are important that your voice is important? Has anybody gone through that? I, I think, Can I um, give you this? Please. Haven't gone through that, but I think being on the receiving end of it mm -hmm. and how good it makes you feel, because sometimes the things that you're doing, you don't realize are that important, but they are mm -hmm. to someone else. So it, it, it helps me to be, to express that gratitude to others when I see them doing something, yeah. because it makes me feel so good when I'm, you know, thanked. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And maybe it's that, that God is working in that space between, and that what you're noticing and what you're saying, God wants that other person to hear, uh, which means your voice isn't just kind of important, it's vital. It is vital. That, uh, say that again. When I take the risk to address that with somebody. It mm -hmm. builds bridges. Mm. It always cracks open an opportunity for the sp spirit to move, yeah. and I am transformed. I don't know about the other person. Mm. Can you pass it back to our sister over here? So <clears throat> I live in Seattle, the land of the nuns, <laughs> and the organization that I was thinking about is um, mostly atheists, very explicitly so, but religiously diverse other than that. Muslims, Jews, some Christians, Wiccans, um, kind of a lot of different traditions. Uh, so I had to spend a lot of time thinking about how I wanted to translate um, mm -hmm. what you'd asked us to do into yes. language that could be received without being offensive. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, and I think that that contextuality is so incredibly important. Um, and a number of people have been asking about that throughout the conference, saying, but what if I'm in a place where saying Jesus or God is a non-starter? Um, and, and there's something, on the one hand, there is something important about like not foisting, not forcing our language, our interpretation onto people, especially if they receive that as, as an insult. Um, what's also true is that sometimes People are responding that way, not necessarily in the case you're naming, Heidi, but for some folks, they've been wounded by church and hearing the word Jesus is a trigger. But what, what can also happen is that if you're sharing about Jesus in a way that is appreciative and, um, and that is frankly the counter to the narrative that they've always thought 
about Jesus, there's a healing process that can begin. Um, so just to know that, that sometimes in the land of the nuns, it's all right to talk about Jesus. You just got to watch <laughs> and do some discernment about that. Let's get... I, can you explain, please? Well, it, I was just thinking that everybody might be thinking, you know, habit nun, not, <laughs> not, not land of the nuns there as in, um, are, are you, have no, have no religious affiliation, have, they're, they're the nuns. So they, they check off the box nun on a Pew study, on the Pew Report study that, that looks at the religious landscape of America. These are the folks who check off no affiliation, like none, I have none. So they are the nuns, you would say. Please, Brother Ali. Thank you. I just come back from uh, Seattle. I went to uh, uh, one church uh, having a meal for uh, uh, people who's outside, living outside, um, and uh, was young people there. I saw the uh, uh, ladies uh, cleaning the space, giving food. Mm. I saw that God because I was a state kid from eight to 18. I know that God was with me with this, all these years, taking care of me. I saw God them, uh, that night uh, giving place, food, and love to mm -hmm. these homeless people. Wow. Yes to see that kind of generosity and presence. Solidarity is a word I think that enters in there too. You know, seeing people crossing over in order to walk with um, and maybe even taking some risks to do that. Um, you know, that, that it's easy to see Jesus in that moment. Yeah, we've got a couple more. I know we need to kind of keep our, keep moving into reconciliation, but guess what? We've actually already started drifting into that. <laughs> Please, sir. Thank you. There is um, a timing aspect to this, to all of this. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things is to watch to see who the people are uh, to whom you might want to address mm -hmm. the issue of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Curcio, as she mentioned earlier, does have this concept that's really quite facile, and it's called make a friend, be a friend, mm -hmm. then bring your friend along to Christ. Mm -hmm. All of you see televangelists. All of you have people come to your front door. Mm -hmm. And part of what's wrong with those processes is that they've gone to step three before they ever got to step one. Yeah, yeah. And so loving someone enough to wait and not foist upon them what they would consider completely foreign material yeah. is pretty important to the whole process of the evangelization of another person. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's why it begins with your curiosity and your gratitude. Yes. If it begins with, I have to acquire a new person, and then it's just figuring out kind of like, how do I get to that point? People can sniff that out a mile away. <laughs> um, again, it's the blood suckers. You know, it's like, no, 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 we don't. I don't want to acquire you. Um, I want to actually be in relationship because I'm being blessed. Here's going to be our last comment. Please. Thank you. Um, every Sunday, I wear two hats, one with the Anglo congregation, one with the Latino congregation. Mm -hmm. I am from uh, Arizona, Glendale, Arizona, St. Andrews. Um, I have been walking in the neighborhood for the last four years. When I invite the Anglo congregation to do the same, there is a tension between membership and discipleship. Mm. You know, I can see that. Uh, so the challenge, when, when, when we address or when we face this challenge, I, I invite them to, into this. When you walk in the neighborhood, try to see the face of Jesus in each people that you found, that you can find on the streets. Uh, around the church, we have uh, clinics, um, a park, uh, two schools, and the church have been helping, have been doing some outreach, you know, ministry there. But I will say this: if you want to move from membership to discipleship, you need to experience 
or you need to see the face of Jesus in each person who is your neighbor. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Yeah. Um, my experience in, in 32 years in the Episcopal Church have been when I working in a community is to divide the community in four pieces. And it's like a cake. Mm -hmm. And I'm the one that will decide which part of the cake I want to eat. Mm -hmm. In my experience in Glendale, it has been the east and the west. So when I move to the east, I can find the low, low, low income families. When I move to the west, I can find the middle class up families. So I will invite all of you, walk, because I know that not all the churches, or all the members are walking at this time. Yeah. Okay. Walking so that will be my advice. Okay. Walk. Look the signs. Look the restaurants. Look how the, your neighborhood change, and then it start to to create a prayer group for prayers because they cannot walk, but they can pray, and then a team that can walk with you and be out. Don't stay inside. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Do you want to say anything about the? from member to discipleship. Oh, yeah, I put on that the sheet like there, uh, Dwight Shiley's book, People of the Way, um, <laughs> is uh, from his introduction, you know, uh, what does it mean to be a member, and what does it mean to be a disciple, and what's the difference, and how um, does being a member sometimes get in the way of being a disciple, which I think often happens. I often tell a story. I was at this church in Lake Forest, uh, Illinois, and my wife and I got invited out to dinner, and it was at somebody who wasn't a member of the parish. We thought, that'll be fun. You know, nobody will be complaining to me about the church or anything. It'll just be a fun dinner. And I'm on line with this guy, and he starts to talk to me. And I thought, this guy's really interesting. I, you know, he travels all over the world and all that stuff. And so we go through the buffet line, and I uh, sit down, and uh, we continue our conversation. And he'd been talking for a while, and then I think he thought, maybe I should... Uh, maybe he should ask me a question. So he said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm rector of the local Episcopal church. He said, that's my church. Oh, dear. <laughs> and I, you know, I've been there for five years or something, right? He was very clear that he was a member. Huh. But I would say there were some growth opportunities in the discipleship department. <laughs> right? Right? And I think that's a cultural piece we need in the Episcopal Church mm -hmm. to figure out. That uh, we need members, yeah, and the members of the body of Christ, it's a good word. But I think in our culture, uh, that club thing that Brian McLaren talks about is, is a strong dynamic. Mm. And I think we need to figure out, it's, it's, it's what I was referring to in the sort of the evangelizing of our own members, is to really call people to say, you are on a spiritual journey that matters to God, so it matters to us. Mm. And we want to, um, more and more, I think the role of clergy and other leaders is coach. We want to coach you in this and share our own struggles and dreams. So anyway, the other thing, can I say one more thing about Acts? Because I was working in this church, and I, one morning I woke up and said, why doesn't this church, I'm working so hard, why doesn't this church just look a little bit more like the book of Acts, just a, just a hair? You know, when you read this stuff where it says, and you know, this Sunday, 4,000 members were added. <laughs> and the next Sunday, 5,000 people were baptized. And you know, it's like, really, really? You know, it's like, oh, oh, okay, okay, I'm reading this stuff. And there's the throwaway line. It says, the church grew because people outside the church looked at it and said, see how they love one another, mm -hmm. which was word and action, but it's love. Yeah. It's, it's the love thing. So anyway. Yeah. yeah. Next. Ha ha. Actually, that is perfect. <laughs> Do you think it's a good um, segue? <laughs> as segues right. go, you can't get better. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, and so, no, that really does take us to, um, to the, the other part of the beautiful part of this overflow um, from, from growing in discipleship to overflowing into not only proclaiming good news, but embodying good news, looking like people of love, looking like people who are loving, liberating, and life-giving with each other. And this is a very simple way of understanding something really complex. Um, but, but reconciliation, I would put to you, really is at base how we embody the way of Jesus. And frankly, 
so many of the examples that you were naming, this is what I love. You were naming the places where you've seen Jesus and talking about how you would thank people for being the face of God in a community. What you're also doing <laughs> um, is if you start that conversation with someone, you're engaged in a reconciling conversation. You're engaged in forming a loving, liberating, life-giving relationship with another person. And especially, and on your handouts it says, across historic systemic divides. Um, and so in a way, that's almost a subset of this bigger reconciliation that God is up to. But the fact is that, that if we're going to do evangelism in the Episcopal Church, it's got to send us across some barriers. It's got to send us beyond ourselves. And that means we've got to be practicing reconciliation. We've got to understand that there are reasons why folk have not come into the church. There are reasons why certain cultures feel like when they see the Episcopal Church welcomes you, they see an invisible sign that says, but not you. You keep your culture outside. You don't read the book well enough, or maybe you don't read at all. Um, you, can't you learn better English? You, I mean, there's so many invisible signs outside our churches, so many reasons why we need to work on reconciliation as we follow Jesus, as we recognize Christ in others, and then learn how to step with tenderness and authenticity and intention across some of these systemic historic boundaries that have stopped us from being in relationship and that have stopped us from living the Jesus way and looking like Jesus. Are you with me? Um, so, and again, this is not just about talking. A lot of it comes down to how we listen. Um, how we listen with people who may have had these experiences with church, who may have had this experience with the culture that is dominant in your church. So we don't know what their experiences have been. We know where we see God in them, perhaps. But the, the thing to do is not to try to figure out the formula, what's the lamb that I'm supposed to offer to them that breaks it all open. The thing to do first is to show up to be open, to not, again, have to have the answers, but instead to listen. Um, listening to each other's deepest pain, listening to each other's deepest truths, listening to each other's deep humanity. And for us, seeing God in that moment, but not, again, feeling like we have to force that onto them. My model for this revolutionary practice is Jesus, actually. Um, most people think of him and we picture Jesus as the guy who went around talking. He was casting out demons, he was preaching, he was teaching, he was using a lot of words. But I think that if you had been there, if you'd actually been walking around with Jesus, you would have seen someone who didn't just do a lot of talking. I think he did a lot of listening. I think he was always listening to children and to elders. I think he was listening to Jews and to Gentiles. He was listening to wealthy young men who thought they had all the answers and to mouthy women who wouldn't take no for an answer. Jesus was listening. Can you even think right now of some moments in scripture where you saw Jesus listening? Where was that happening? Go for it, say it nice and loud. The woman at the well. Woman caught in adultery. I see a pattern, women, yes. <laughs> he knew to listen to women, hello. Go ahead. Let the children come to me. Let the children come to me, yes. Yes, creating that space, that hospitable space, listening to children. Where else was Jesus listening? Nicodemus, say more. Um, Nicodemus, Pharisee, comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, on earth, or Mm -hmm. In his trial, he's listening. Yeah. Please. Let's get this to you. Sing. Thanks. When the 
Mary, the sister of Lazarus, is crying. Why weren't you here, and why did you let him die? Mm. Oh, my God. And he just took that. He took that. He took in her anger. He took in her disappointment. And he just, he kept it. He held it. Instead of having to have that answer immediately to fix it. Yeah. Here it comes. Where was Jesus listening? When he arrived at the multitude of people trying to get in the pool to be healed. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Jesus listening. En la cruz, escuchando al ladrón. Can someone tell us, what's that? On the cross. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely, definitely. Who do you say that I am? Right? Hey, he posed the question. Right. Yeah, and let them say, absolutely. There's a power in this listening, and I am convinced that Jesus listening was actually what made it possible for him to form this countercultural community of love, a community that was able to cross the deepest of divides. I can kind of see him gathering this crew, this motley crew of folk who had no business together. And I can see him saying to them, I need you to receive each other as if you are receiving God. And I need you to listen to each other as if you are listening to God. There's power in this kind of listening, power to heal, power to restore. And I hope that you've experienced it at some point in your own life. Some moment when, um, when you were speaking a word that was so true that you felt bare, you felt exposed, you felt vulnerable, but the other person, like you had taken that risk, and the other person just held it with you. And they didn't flinch. Instead, maybe they leaned forward just a bit, and they let you know somehow that what you were saying mattered that your voice mattered. Even though everything about your story had said that your voice would not matter. That's what the power of listening is. And I am convinced, I am convinced that the structures that diminish black lives, brown lives, native lives, poor lives, women's lives, queer lives, young lives, these systems will not fundamentally change and we will not be free unless we are doing this kind of listening with each other as if something that is true and necessary is coming out of the mouth of that other person. That's reconciliation. I wish, um, and I've been working with some folks on this, that we could create spaces where we could very intentionally do this kind of listening and um, and there's some questions that could help that process. And I think that they're on your sheet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brave listening questions. And, um, and we won't necessarily ask each other these questions right now, but I would put them to you as questions, especially in this season of deep, deep division, a season when people don't know the first thing <laughs> about how could I possibly sit with that other person and like, See God, I see enemy. I'm sorry, I cannot go there. But to begin to wonder, to be genuinely curious with each other, and to ask, and I get this first question, um, I think I had been wondering it, and then I heard an amazing podcast with Ruby Sales. Do people know who Ruby Sales is? Civil rights leader, um, brilliant, brilliant theologian, and as a child, she was the teenager who, um, who Jonathan Daniels, the seminarian who was killed in 1965, the young man who had come from Episcopal Divinity School to Alabama, he pushed Ruby Sales out of the way when he took the bullet. So this young woman grew up to be just a legend around civil rights. And she's been watching America, watching us tossing and turning and the question that she's been asking as a black woman um, is first off, where does it hurt? And she's been inviting people to ask that question with each other because what she's noticed is that a lot of the things that are going on where we're hurting each other are because people have been hurt themselves or they've experienced hurt. 
So imagine us asking, creating spaces where we could ask, where does it hurt? And then just hold that. And then ask, what have you lost? A lot of people have been experiencing a lot of loss. And again, you might look at it and say, so what's your loss, that you don't have a certain kind of privilege anymore? Sorry. But on the experiential end of it, it is a loss. So creating spaces where we can all say, what have I lost? What do you love? Making the turn, not just staying in that place of what's wrong, what's wrong, but aren't you curious about what someone that you see as so angry as enemy, aren't you curious what they also love? Because it may be that what they love sounds a little bit like what you love. And maybe you could learn to love something together, maybe. And finally, what do you dream? Which is a way of getting again at, at what God might be up to in the space between us. What God might be calling into being between people who thought they had nothing to do with each other. What do you dream can help to surface that? There are some churches that have already begun asking these questions just among their members, recognizing that there's a lot of difference in, in one church, much less between the members of that church and another one. Um, so you might want to imagine how you could start, even at the vestry level, having some of these conversations and then slowly, again, practice, slowly practicing, stretching the circles wider and wider maybe stretching them and introducing questions like this when you're sitting um, with your family at Thanksgiving. Who knows? Um, when that fight is on the horizon, questions like this might be a way to shift that energy and actually to go to the place where God is waiting for you anyway. Um, so this is, what, um, this is what reconciliation can look like, especially when it's rising from, overflowing from that love and that following of Jesus and discovering our own capacity to see Jesus in others and to build loving, liberating, life-giving relationships with them. I'm gonna stop right here and, um, and ask just kind of more generally, have you ever been in a space where you could do this kind of sharing? Have you ever seen people able to cross over? And what we wonder is, what made that possible? Please, let's mind the wisdom of the group. Um, after the Jean Robinson vote in 2003, whenever that was, mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't know, the church divided really badly over the issue of homosexuality at that point. Um, I had a church that was split about 50-50, and downstairs was the parish hall, upstairs was the sanctuary. Downstairs, we had safe space for conversation because we knew when we went upstairs, we were all facing in the same direction and eating at the same table, and that really helped to have the conversation to know that's where we were all going. Mm -hmm. Anybody else seen communities able to, to do some of this opening and seeing Christ in each other when it was really hard. Please. This summer after the, in Dallas, after the police officers oh, were killed, Lord, um, there was a group that came together and it was just on Facebook said, community conversations. And so whoever, and it was just whoever showed up, um, black and white together, we were in this, um, in the Dallas Children's Theater and the facilitator um, put us in small groups, um, um, black people and white people, and questions were thrown out to us, and we just listened to each other and heard um, points of view that we hadn't heard before. And I remember sitting there um, thinking, as someone, a uh, young black man told his story, um, I had no idea what some folks have to deal with every single day. Mm. And because we 
we listened to each other, it, it really made a difference. And so I remember coming back the second time, looking for those people that, who I had spoken with and just wanting to connect again. Thank you. We did an interesting thing in Wilmington, North Carolina, where I work um, and live. Uh, we read Jim Wallace's recent book, America's Original Sin, by Privilege and a Bridge to the Future. And we did it as a summer book study and we invited people widely and I thought in August book study we'd have like eight people or something first night we had 30 the next night we had 40 the next night we had 50 we ended up with 120 people and only about 10% from our congregation Ooh. but it, I commend it to you as a useful tool to just um, the deep listening it was just this deep listening um, in a very traditional part of the South where um, when I first moved there, they didn't talk about this war between the states. They talked about the Northern aggression. Ooh. And I was Ooh. like, well, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, just, it was an example of this fierce kind of listening. I saw a hand over here. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. My wife and I uh, are in Texas and there's a program in the Texas prisons, very predominantly in the Texas prisons, are bridges to life. Mm. And we go in for once a week for 14 weeks and work with groups of prisoners and small groups and march them through a whole series of exercises uh, in which they go through accepting responsibility for why they're there, which is difficult enough to do, uh, on through accountability, on through repentance, you have to keep in mind that most of these folks themselves are damaged goods before they came there. They've had problems in their lives, or the, and, and those problems uh, were reflected in what they did to get themselves in prison to begin with. The most difficult step they have to go through is, is forgiving others who have hurt them in their lives, because they can't do it face to face. They have to be able to forgive without oh, having so seen them. Then we go through the process of reconciliation with them, and then finally restitution to a relationship with God. And I have to tell you, being there as a facilitator is one of the most rewarding experiences to see the progress of what happens to these people as they go through this progress themselves. Thank you. One more, and then I think we'll, yeah. we'll wind up because we have a group coming in. <laughs> Um, Tamara Plummer, I work at Episcopal Relief and Development. Um, so I haven't seen many of these done well in church spaces, mm -hmm. but I worked in student affairs before I worked in church. And there are amazing models for facilitating conversations, for, um, they call it container holding is what I would offer. Um, so allowing people to introduce themselves as a first activity and if it takes 45 minutes, it's okay. Just so that the room can develop places of safety before you begin to have the difficult conversation. Um, and then the last thing I think is to recognize our power and our privilege as church people, regardless of what we look like or how much money is in our pocket, that often we are already coming with a set of cultural understandings as church folk who worship and say the same service every week when we enter into relationship. And honoring and recognizing that before I even enter into relationship often allows me to enter from a different place. Thank you. We're gonna need to wind up. I'm sorry, this is rich conversation and I just wanna thank you all for being part of this today. I think maybe we'll invite you to stand as you're able and we pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the gifts you give us, and especially the gift of being together to talk about the Jesus movement, and we pray that you'll give us grace and wisdom to be part of it. Um, bless us as we go forth from this place. Um, may our hearts grow in the love that you so freely give to each one of us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Blessings in the movement, Blessings. friends. Blessings.